Welcome, welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing? Hope you are doing well. My name is Andrew Kuhn, Focus Compounding, sitting next to Jeff Gannon. Jeff, how's it going today? Uh, it's going very well, Andrew. How's it going with you? It's going great. We hope it's going great for everybody else as well. If this is the first time you are tuning in with the both of us, uh, be sure to hit that subscribe button wherever you are listening or watching us here today. If you're watching us on the screen right now, um, uh, follow me on Twitter, at Focus Compound. That is the best place to get everything that we put out there into the interweb, uh, at Focus Compound. Follow me on Twitter. Um, in today's podcast, we are going to be continuing on with our Snap Judgments um, uh, episode where we go over stocks that people on Twitter, our listeners, etc., uh, want us to look at. Uh, when we do do this, we go to quickfs.net, we type in the ticker, and then we just do a quick snap judgment. Bear in mind, a lot of these companies we may be familiar with, but we may not be updated uh, with the current situation. So, you know, don't send me a DM saying, well, here's the story, blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, we were just kind of looking at it from a snap judgment. Um, and a lot of people like to see when we talk a lot about just certain things that um, we take away from doing this. So I think it's uh, a great way just to connect with all the listeners and the viewers. So we are going to continue on with that. So I guess my first question, though, before we do that is how mm-hmm. much of your research process is actually doing a snap judgment on a company. Like, do you ever pull up like a screen and just go through and look at it from like a high level overview like this and say, well, that could look interesting. Or do you try to stay away from doing something like this because you could be missing the bigger picture? Because I've come across a couple names mm-hmm. or companies that we're familiar with because we've done the research and we're like, well, you know, in a few years, this will actually look a lot different than it is today. Right. So the... And as I've been doing this more lately, but this is something I've done for a while, actually. The first thing I will do is um, look at the very long-term chart. So not in uh, QuickFS, but just a stock chart in like OTC markets is the one that I use uh, commonly uh, because it, you can see what it's like over the last 20 or 25 years. And then combined with that, looking at the last 10 years, the actual financial results, both of those things, and then reading the business description. And those together can help me figure out if this is something that's created value over time and if it's predictable enough and in, um, in a business that's something I might be able to understand. So it's not so much even judging like uh, whether I like it or not, what the price is. I try to avoid really looking at the price and stuff at that point, but just is there any way that I could evaluate this sort of thing, mm-hmm. you know? And if you, if you don't have a... Um, you know, I would be. I would need a lot more research on something that hadn't uh, multiplied by a lot over a period of twenty years or something as a stock, as compared to one that had. And I would uh, need a lot more research on something that had a inconsistent past history. Uh, so it's not really the level of things, uh, but like how many times they lose money in the last ten years, how wobbly is the margin, what, you know, is revenue all over the place, things like that, it gives me more of an idea of like whether I can even figure this company out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's more like that. Can I understand this and stuff? Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I do use QuickFS and a chart for that. Yeah, yeah. it's interesting that you use the chart. Mm-hmm. A lot of investors probably, from the fundamental perspective, don't do that. And I know that's something that we put out a checklist out yeah. into the internet. And it was like, take the long-term Kager, take the 10-year Kager, take the five-year Kager, and just kind of get an idea of, well, has this company actually created value for shareholders over time? I found that to be the best screen. Uh, I like it because yeah. we've looked at companies where maybe it's like a controlled situation and it could be like, wow, this is a two PE or this is so cheap or right. the private market value of this business would be just multiples of where it's in the market. But it's like the stock's gone nowhere for 15 to 20 years. Yeah. So a stock that's already gone up five or 10 times or whatever over 20 years um, it is just more likely. Uh, and I realized that over time, because without having that in place, I realized that overwhelmingly the stocks that I was buying, uh, you know, at the end of the process, that I went back and looked at it, these were already 10x stocks. They've been 10x and were still small and overlooked and stuff. Mm-hmm. But they went 10x from being a five million dollar company to 50 million already, and I could already see that. And you know, a lot of microcap things don't do that, and so it can help to narrow it down to say, all right, well, if it's already done that, it actually turns out that a lot of times I end up buying the stock, mm-hmm. and I could have um, focused in more on that. Uh, with stocks earlier on i so. like that no i like that i think that's a good good way to start especially in micro cap land yeah and really small stocks and things tend and usually not to get as like just incredibly um 
uh, popular, caught up in a craze the way that some big stocks do. So you, you're less likely to have the kind of thing that we saw with Microsoft, where the business is doing well for a while, but the stock doesn't do well for a decade or two. That's just less likely because bubbles don't develop in you know twenty mm-hmm. million dollar stocks normally. Uh, so you get more of like the long term history of whether they've created value and stuff, and also just whether they've been around a long time. Yeah, it's much easier for me to analyze a stock that's been public since 1995 than one that's been public for five years. Yeah. Yeah. And of course some people listening sure there's gonna be some stocks that may have come public or did a reverse merge something along those lines three four two years who knows what it is where there's not you know 20 years of a stock chart but it's just i like right. it as a first place it kind of started like well it has this yeah. create value for sure but also i'm not that interested in like catching the first um move in a stock yeah that's not so our style. like we were when we were talking about geico i mean for buffett if he had bought it and held it to today now he bought it through you know as berkshire so it's no longer a public company but probably would have been roughly a ten thousand x so you know look at his investment with Apple. so like you can not buy it when it goes up 10 times yeah but you can buy it from the 10 to the 100 mm-hmm. or you cannot buy it when it goes up 100 times in some cases with really big stocks but if you still got 10 times out of it, it would be great anytime you know there's not a lot of investments that go up 10 times and you're um sorry that you're too late to it that way you mm-hmm. can afford to be late on those sorts of things Good and we're companies. still talking about very small stocks by the way with us when we're talking about this mm-hmm. i'm literally talking about stocks that went from 10 million to 100 million you know 40 million to 400 million at the most those kinds of things not something that went to 40 billion um you know th- there's a difference there because it is hard mm-hmm. it, the size becomes a huge difference in those cases but it usually doesn't when we're talking about very small stocks you know they usually don't have that problem that they've already gone up by so much that they've saturated their market mm-hmm. good companies tend to trade around close around or close to their all-time highs oh yeah That's because their earnings are always at all-time yeah. highs yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah which is good that's what i like right <laughs> yeah that's what I um like. but i should say like i have no problem with a stock that created a lot of value and then it's gone nowhere for 10 years if i had a long enough stock chart and i could see that it created 10 on value for 40 years and went nowhere for 10 years i'd be very interested yeah that's a great situation yeah. Yeah. yeah i don't i'm not talking about recent performance that way mm-hmm. yeah Okay, first stock, BGFV, he says, sitting on $5 per share in cash, low PE multiple versus historical, high short interest, big uptick in earnings last two years. Yeah. Uh, big I five sports. Specialized in uh, retail. Uh, the pr- private equity group that specializes in retail. Well, they're in specialty retail. Okay. Big five sports goods corporation operates as a sporting goods retailer in the Western United States. The company's products include athletic shoes, apparel, and accessories, as well as a selection of outdoor and athletic equipment for team sports, fitness, camping, hunting, fishing, tennis, golf. You guys get the picture. Market cap, $532 million. EV, $413 million. Current PE, five times. EV free cash flow, 2.4 times. EV to sales, 0.3 and it's sitting around our 10-year median margin on EBIT of 2.6, so kind of near that uh, 3% level is what you would want to see. Gross margins have been pretty predictable. Uh, looks like ranging from 32% right. to the operating 3 not. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, right? Uh, the gross margin, everything above that tells you about the actual business that they're doing. Everything below that tells you about the people that are running the business. Um Let's see. In the last three years have radically different results. Yeah. So it's interesting. When I see low operating margins, I immediately go to return on equity, return on invested capital. Okay. If that's high from, you know, we've gone over this on the podcast that tells you that, well, you know, they're turning over their, mm. their inventory or their, uh, you know, their balance sheet frequently, which if you look at Costco's business model, that makes sense for them. Mm. Here you're getting, it looks like, and I don't even want to use 2020 because that could have been an abnormal year, but look at the past right so 2019 backwards uh low operating margins and low return on equity so if i exclude the last three years it is possible to kind of use operating margin and compare that to price and stuff and get an idea Mm -hmm. um the last three years is so different and this could be you know the most recent year and depending on when the 2019 year ended could be covid related Mm -hmm. so um certainly the very good year could be covid related but also part of the bad year because i don't know when the year ends um could have been but uh other than that we have a range that's mostly around two percent the operating margin maybe you'd say three percent you know in the seven years before that we're looking at there's an occasional four percent whatever but it's not incredibly volatile so it makes more sense and the gross margin not so that makes a lot of sense and given today's price and stuff, it would seem not particularly cheap. Uh, it actually seems somewhat in line, I would say, with like a normal sort of price if you're using the like more current year sales and that past operating margin. 
the big issues are sales are the same now as they were, you know, five years ago mm -hmm. or whatever. And uh, operating margins are a lot, lot higher now. So things could be a lot different. Uh, I would say that prior to the last few years, I would not think it cheap based on the long-term results. So the results from 2011 to 2017 suggest this might be a fairly priced stock and not expensive in today's market, but it does not stand out as very cheap. Um, the one thing I'd like to see is the cash flow statement, actually. Yeah, I was looking at that free cash yeah. flow growth. I wondered if it had dramatic change in, yeah. Yeah. And I was curious about that and whether that had to do with COVID. Probably. And I don't really understand what that is. But uh, cash flow things that could... Inventories. Then, all right. Then could change there. dramatically due to COVID. Uh, just so people know I've seen a lot of that yeah and so sometimes that shows you having really great results in a year and uh, really bad results after that what tends to happen though of course is if you have a huge amount of free cash flow this year and your business keeps growing the next year the flows are going to go in the opposite way in a really big way you have to build up your inventories a lot mm -hmm. now actually what's happening in the economy overall is that's not happening the way that it should be because there's actually certain shortages and things. So people have not been able to fill inventory and, and things like that as fast as they'd want to. And so instead you've had price increases, but you know, um, the first supplies and things like that. So that's kind of a result of not being able to ramp up as quickly of what you unwound during uh, COVID, you know, and prior to COVID. So uh, I see that in a lot of companies, the change in working capital and stuff being very confusing recently. So I just a caution to people and you can see that here, like, um, the cash flow, cash flow from operations is just really changed by a huge amount. We can mm -hmm. see it, you know, it, two years ago, it's uh, or a year and a half ago or whatever, it was 14 million and now it's 180 million. Mm -hmm. So I obviously don't use one year numbers ever on that. It is interesting about the buyback though, right? Mm -hmm. Do I mean buyback? No, uh, debt repayment. So yeah. basically the working capital change went to repaying debt. If you add that up cumulatively, they used um, a decrease in working capital pay off debt. But I also don't know if it's a change in like the scope of the business because it's the other thing that you can do. You can, you know, partially liquidate and then pay off debt and stuff, which could be a good decision. So I don't know. Got it. Cool. Sometimes uh, people email or text me. So we have, okay. uh, we've gone over before booking holdings. Yeah, that is a big company. Big company. You listed mm -hmm. this as I believe uh, when we did like five stocks over 10 billion yes. that you'd be interested in. Mm -hmm. um, uh Let's see. So we've had, so revenue got cut in half basically right. last year from 2019, right? Mm -hmm. As a lot of travel related companies did. Uh, credible gross margins, you've always liked this business. I mean, we, I guess from this peak? perspective, it's, yeah. it's like, how would you frame, okay, this is the type of research I would do, or this is, you know, how I would frame the investment case or potentially the bear case. So it's trading at about seven times peak sales, I guess. Something like that. Uh, sales peaked around 15 billion or something like that. We're at 100 and some billion. I'd say we could call it like seven times uh -huh. peak sales. So I would use that that number. So it is like seven times peak sales, although I didn't look carefully. The It's telling me the price of sales and the EV to sales are similar. So I'm going to guess that there's not a big net cash or debt position. So let's say that's true. So about seven times sales for this business. Um, so yeah, if you assume a complete return in terms of travel and everything to what it was before, uh, then I would say it doesn't look terribly expensive. If you look at the operating margin, all of that, it looks appropriate uh, kind of price for business this quality. If you have like a 35% operating margin and are trading at seven times sales, that does not seem unreasonable. So I actually don't think this is an expensive company uh, that I don't, it doesn't look to me expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, doesn't mean that it's the best thing to buy or whatever, but if you like the business and, and everything, it certainly doesn't look outrageous, the price that you're paying compared to the uh, past sales number. And that's what I would use. Let's say you were managing a billion dollars. Is this something that you'd be looking at? No. If I was managing a hundred billion dollars, it is. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So let's say, okay, so if you were- If managing. I was Warren Buffett, would I be looking at booking? Absolutely. It would be near the top of my list of things to look at because I don't see a lot of companies that have as much room for growth in their industry that are a hundred billion dollars sure. in market yeah. cap. Like say, take a Buffett or something. Someone like that could literally- uh, is looking for something to buy 10% of a company. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's a possibility to buy $10 billion worth of something, then that's very attractive. So I, I would it would be on that list. I don't know exactly what it would be, but you know, it, this would probably be, if it, you know, this is a top 10 stocks that are $100 billion or more or mm -hmm. something. Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, in part because I think that the like actual real market, like their, the market opportunity that they have could still be more than you know could still be a lot bigger than what it was when it peaked 
previously. So actually, I think that there'll be even more. Um, now it could go to competitors, but there'll be even more um, reservations and things through. Uh, but you know, they use a lot of different terms for it. But people who've used booking understand what I'm talking about in terms of the process. Going through something like that uh, to be how rooms are sold, I think, will increase a lot over time. So if you had the same market share that you did in 2019 or whatever, I wouldn't be surprised if that gets you twice as much money at some point in the future. That is that doing 15 billion then, I don't know if it's 10 years from now or more, but that same market share will be worth at least double, you know, in real terms. And then travel and stuff, you know, before COVID grew a bit faster, you know, internationally, certainly grew a bit faster than the overall economy. So it's a bit of a growth industry. Um, like certain forms of entertainment and stuff, because, you know, th- some things like food and clothing stuff grow a bit slower. So some other things uh, grow a bit faster. And I think wouldn't be surprised if it grows a little bit faster than the economy long term. So all those things are good. Um, you know, and then obviously returns on capital and stuff in the business are great and they could use the money to buy back their stock if they want to. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm just curious to look at a stock chart of the company. Well, the simple answer will be good. Yeah. Yeah. So load. You don't get a lot of these ads on yours, do you? I get no ads on mine because <laughs> I uh, use stuff to make sure there's no ads ever. Yeah, so it's it's at all time high. Yeah, it looks like yeah. Is it really? Yeah. Wow. Huh. Well, then it wasn't as expensive as I would have thought before COVID. That's true. That's really impressive. Let, let's look at the cash. Can we yeah, look at cash flow, flow statement? Because yeah. I just was curious if the one thing that could have thrown that off. No. Right. They did not, their share count didn't go up. No. Because that was the one thing I was curious about. No, it didn't. They buy back a lot. Yeah. Yeah, historically, they they just bought back some stock and stuff. Hmm. I don't know. I mean, they do, I should say, like, in terms of what we talk about market power and all this, I think they do face some risks in terms of sourcing their traffic and everything about whether things go to them or they go to Google. And that sort of is a concern for people longer term in this business. Um how much power does something like Google have over them and others? Uh, so how much of it goes to those kinds of companies? And is that something those companies want to do and lose the, the ad revenue and stuff from it, but instead have travel mm-hmm. things themselves? You know, I've come across a couple, like I would call it either entertainment or travel related things where it's a very similar situation. The chart, you know, the stock's kind of at like close to an all time high or near yeah. it. And then I'm like, yeah, but that's on, peak earnings from prior to COVID. It's just hard to handicap that. So it's like kind of like you got both forces working That's against interesting. you. That's interesting. Because I, I would say, you know, it, it doesn't bother me. I don't think business travel will come back. I think if you owned hotels and things that you need business travel for, mm-hmm. I don't think that that will come back in the same way. But I don't expect COVID to have a, much of an impact on travel long term. And the value of a business like this is overwhelmingly in later years is not oh, how yeah, much sure. you'll earn in years mm-hmm. like this. So I don't have a problem with that. And certainly, you know, entertainment things for the most part, I don't think have been changed greatly by COVID. We talked a little bit about movie theaters and things. And I think they've been heard a little bit in in terms of people expecting things to be available streaming faster and stuff like that. So it's changed habits. I don't think it would change things in this industry that much that way. Um, so I think that using past the prior peak is a good idea. Mm -hmm. Now we're looking at from a very long-term perspective, though, when we talk about any stock. So I do want to caution people that when I say that I don't expect COVID to have changed, you know, the trajectory of what travel will be over time, that does not mean that it won't be lower in 2021, 2022, 2023 than it otherwise would have been. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying, I don't think in 2030 it will be different than it would have been without COVID. Mm-hmm. It'll um, look like a blip. Yeah. So for a company like this, you know, you're, I mean, uh, yeah, you're, what I said, it's probably seven times peak sales that you had previously and all of that. Uh, yeah, I, I would look at it. Mm-hmm. I would think a lot about it, sure. And then the other one, Altria Group, ticker MO. A lot of people have talked about this recently. Market cap, mm-hmm. $86 billion. Enterprise value, $112 billion. Uh, current valuation, PE, 19 times. EV to free cash flow, 19 times. Uh, EV to sales, 5.3 times. Um, uh, let's see. 10-year K on revenue, 2.1 times. 10-year median margins. We're at an EBIT margin of 46%. Um, so a lot of people... Uh, we were asked cheaper. about this once before and stuff. I mean, I really think this is a regulatory thing lobbying type thing uh how successful they are in lobbying for what they want to have happen 
So for instance, um, online and stuff, there's some uh, places that don't want to show things about tobacco and stuff like that, right? To them, that's a benefit. You want more restrictive things from Google and Facebook and all those sorts of things. Um, you want restrictions on things that aren't um, uh, that aren't the technologies that you're going to go with in terms of delivery of nicotine to people and all of that. I think as long as you get regulations and society moving in the direction that you want and you, whether that's you adapting to it or you shaping society's perceptions of those things, lawmakers' perceptions, whatever, uh, you'll be successful. And so generally in an industry like this, you do want to bet on the companies that have the most uh, power that way, the most lobbying power, uh, lobbying power, the most, all of those sorts of things. Uh, absolutely. And that's a big part of it. And it, the biggest risks in things like tobacco and stuff, I would say, is investing in a company that's on the wrong side of what the future trends will be. And so I think that that's more likely with a small company that doesn't have any uh, power on that and is not aligned with other companies that are going to do uh, one, something one way or the other. But I, I just don't think it has much to do with free market economics of what people want to do. I don't mm -hmm. think the future will be with how people want to smoke or what prices they want or whatever. I think those will basically be set by like governments and things like that. Yeah. So would you be interested in this company if you're managing billions and billions of dollars? Or do you think the whole lobbying uh, situation would be something that's just too unknowable? Or like the regulatory crackdown, potentially? I think it's somewhat noble. I mean, I, I think I have an idea of what they're lobbying for and who's opposing it and all those sorts of things. Um, I don't know. If I had to buy a company like that, it would probably be them. Mm. Yeah. It's tough. The, you know, uh, it would be an interesting industry to be invested in. I mean, you obviously have ethical concerns that people have from the perspective of the product that they're selling and all that that people talk about. But from what I was just talking about and stuff, I mean, they, I don't know. I think there's a, I think there's sometimes the reporting of what they're doing and why they're doing it in certain things is not, um, uh, is not as I think some investors uh, I, I don't know that the news and the way that it's presented is accurate to what is really happening in terms of the industry and why it's happening who's doing what and so I think that is a big issue about confusion uh, when I talk about the lobbying thing it's not just what they want to have accomplished but also the amount to which you want it to appear that something you don't want is being done so um, it's very complex. I won't get into all of it uh, because I just think it's not worth it. But they've done some things in that. As an example, they've like acquired some stuff basically for the purpose of having it. Um, they, but they bought some stuff basically just to exit that just because it's helpful from a lobbying type perspective and stuff. It, sometimes they would like to present things as them losing, uh, which jewel, is what right? they want to win. Jewel, didn't they invest? In yeah, they uh, they've done other things too. Um, we, we, I think it's very hard to get information that uh, to follow the information and have a good idea of what's happening uh, because I my perception of it is both the way that the company presents things and the way that the media interprets things is not necessarily that accurate to the underlying um, what's positive and what's negative. Mm -hmm. I think often things are presented as being good news or, or bad news that are not. So I just think it's very, very difficult uh, to have an understanding of it from secondary sources that way and stuff. And it's there's just industries like that. This is a very tricky industry that way. Um, yeah. I think there's not very good information on what's really happening and why. Got it. Let's see. NLS. What is going on here? I don't know if we have the... Um, uh, design, develop sources and markets, cardio and strength fitness products. Yeah, like Nordic Track and stuff like that kind of company. Uh-huh. Yeah. I'm familiar with this company from a long time ago. Let's see. Current P three times, even free cash flow seventeen point five times. You're seeing a lot of that with is that like on a TTM basis? Through yeah, look at revenues from two thousand twenty were up or from two thousand nineteen were up seventy eight percent. Right. So the whole probably right. work at home, it's stay at home, in home exercise. Yeah, it's kinda yeah. like the Peloton thing. Mm -hmm. Um 
Let's see. So uh, EBIT to sales, 0.3, EBIT, 9.1. It's just like, but that's, you know, on last year's numbers. I just avoid companies like this because of the change in, um, it, because of the difficulty that I have with predicting people's behavior. We've talked about that. Things gyms. that you stay away from, health related, yeah, health, all those fashion. Uh, yeah, because you, gyms, can, you yeah. can see it in their results. You can see in the results of a yeah, lot of things. Turn up best um, it's all over. Whether it's a diet or exercise thing or whatever, it, it, it becomes a self-defeating uh, instead of self-reinforcing sort of process. So as it's adopted by more people, that sets about things that eventually cause its downfall um, and vice versa. And so it has a natural cyclical sort of thing, which is different from uh, from Coke or something, mm -hmm. you know, from Coca-Cola, which, it, you know, is self-reinforcing trend over time. And those are the two things that kind of look at the difference. I, I think there's a constant thing with fitness and health things and stuff that are... Um, uh, that basically are constantly cyclical. Now you could trade it constantly. Mm -hmm. You know, any of these things you could buy on the anticipation that eventually things will turn around the other way and then sell it. So whenever it gets popular, you sell it that way. And it sort of is a fad thing or whatever. And actually I, that might make a lot of sense as long-term holdings. I think they're tough. Got it. Next one, Card Factory PLC. Card Factory PLC operates as a specialist retailer of greeting cards in the United Kingdom. The company designs, sources, prints, warehouses, produces, distributes, and sells greeting cards, uh, dressings, balloons, and gifts. Uh, let's see. Current market cap is $256 million, EV $401 million. Um, uh, revenue has gone from $412 million in 2012 to three hundred. million. 89 million in 2021 um margins have pretty much stayed i guess well, kind of bounced around a lot but they fell off a little bit in 2021 for this reporting year ebit sales one times 10-year median margins on ebit 21.8 percent uh, i could tell this would just be kind of hard to analyze from a snap judgment perspective so looks like it, it operates approximately 1016 card factory stores and four franchise stores okay it certainly looks very driven by volume Mm -hmm. because you have a fairly low margin but fairly high operating margin business um low gross margin is what you're saying yeah low gross margin higher operating margin um and you can see the effect that it had and in fact the possibility that some gross margin stuff is affected by volume too in terms of the most recent numbers so it would be something that were it to bounce back might bounce back in a very big way uh but then obviously there's concern there'd be concerns about people about whether this is like a business and terminal decline or something like that mm -hmm. so i don't know if you get rewarded with a really big multiple but it is something that like to bet on for a single year reversal if you knew what was going to happen with sales or something uh would have good you know you might be able to make money as a value stock on sort of a flip of it that way um because of the structure of the mm -hmm. of uh, how much how revenue is converted into profits but that does depend on if people are really excited about it you know that way you know because sometimes you do unfortunately see a stock that earnings go up a lot and then the p is really low so i don't know what the p was on this before jackson financial inc class it's not a lot of debt on this uh, through its subsidiaries, primarily provides a suite of annuities as retirement savings and income solutions to retail investors in the United States. It offers variable fixed index and fixed annuities. So an annuity company. Um, um, I don't know what happened from 2018 to 2019. Maybe this was a spinoff or something along those yeah, lines. Yeah, I don't know about this company without reading more detail yeah. about what it does. Um, yeah. Let's see. KMT. Oh. Kind of metal. Mm -hmm. Develops and applies tungsten carbides, yeah. ceramics, and super hard materials and solutions for use in metal cutting and extreme wear applications to enable customers work against corrosion and high temperature conditions worldwide. Yeah, I actually looked at this company a little. Look at that ROIC. Yeah, that, that's the thing I go, yeah, point out. Yeah. All over the place for people not watching. Mm -hmm. As it's short cyclical cycle. as it can we, get. We normally, yeah. I mean, we see some cyclical things, but you don't. we don't look at a lot because of businesses with short cycles. Yeah, it's like every couple of years. Right. You, you don't normally look at businesses that have like a five-year or something cycle. So you looked at this company. I have looked at this company in the past, yeah. Um, I think the issue that you see... <laughs> is the cyclicality right yeah so it doesn't look anything like a um 
uh, business like we were talking about, like banking or whatever, where it's consistency mm-hmm. over time. The instead you have margins that are all over the place, and the margins are. Uh, it's not just margins. We we could look here. Uh, what tends to happen is when you have very different levels of gross profit. Um, it's like actual gross profit, not just the margin, but the actual level of gross profit jumping all over the place. That's not really normal for companies. You know, you that tends to highlight that it has something to do with um, periods of scarcity and surplus in your in your industry. Like yeah, semiconductor there's, on there's steroids. Yeah, exactly. Um, and that's what we're seeing here. And you can see that with the very different operating margins. Um, if you time it right, obviously it works out great. Uh, I think we talked about. Um, I know that we talked about it, uh, the, like the net net that we didn't buy, yeah, and uh, involved with steel stuff, and that would certainly have outperformed any stock that we bought by a lot, mm-hmm. um, because as you can imagine, Freeman, the, the inventory that they had, just the profit on mm-hmm. between the time they bought the inventory and the time that they sold it, because if the steel they were buying probably went up two hundred percent, would be so big that would be a significant part of their market cap. So it's like Buffett always says with that, you know, if you buy something as a net net or whatever, there's that hiccup. Literally in one year, they can make a huge part of their Puff. market cap just because because the uh, price of steel goes up or something. Um, so here, you know, I, I don't know. I just, for, you know, for me, obviously, it's too hard in terms of the cyclicality. But you can trade those sorts of things and stuff. You know, value investors do that. So you basically look at the long-term averages and you buy it on price to sales or price to buck, probably. Um, price to peak sales. Like figure figure out what the peak sales are, the bottom sales, things like that is more useful than any one year sales. But you just you have to adjust it for the cyclicality, and you might want to buy at a point where it actually looks the P is high. You know, mm-hmm. that tends to be more attractive than buying when the P is low. So, and the P is high right now. Innova International Inc. It's a technology and analytics company provides online financial services in the United States, Brazil, Australia, and Canada. The company offers installment loans, lines of credit accounts, receivables, purchase accounts. So it's online fintech. I guess you could think about it. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, uh, interesting. Market cap, $1.3 billion. EV, $1.9 billion. PE, three times. EV to sales, two times. 10-year median margins on EBIT, 18%. Return on equity numbers have been good. EV to free cash flow, 44 so you have extreme growth in assets and revenue going from 480 million in revenue in 2011 to 1 billion 84 million to yeah i mean it, it's major growth but it's not you know um startling that oh. way because uh, it's fairly well I, I mean for part of that period it's fairly steady you don't you're not seeing a lot of like you know 70% there there is in the beginning there but you're not seeing like 70% growth or something mm-hmm. you're seeing more of high stable growth but then you have individual years that are down I don't know what that is I don't know if that's a currency uh, um translation issue or what we're seeing it's very unusual and if you look the thing that stands out here is you know where the company's headquartered and all of that with what they say that they're doing that they're providing financial services in the U.S., Brazil, Australia, and Canada, um, and then them being headquartered, headquartered in, Chicago. in Chicago. Yeah, why is it something that stands out? Well, it's odd. It's not normal, um, which is fine. But then I don't. Are they reporting in dollars? And if they're reporting in dollars, then those are a bunch of other currencies that they're in. So then the translation of that each year might throw things off. So we could see a year where we think that the revenue growth was negative too but actually the in constant currency of the local currencies it yeah. could have been up to 15 mm-hmm. percent, and the dollar just strengthened by that much in, in a year or weakened by that much in a year so that's the part that's hard uh, i don't know got it a couple more mck mckesson corporation mm-hmm. 31 billion dollar market cap ev 35 billion um uh, let's see ev to sales 0.1 10 year median margins on EBIT, 1.7. EV to free cash flow, 10 times. Very large company. Gross margins, pretty stable and predictable. <laughs> and I'll low, be a tiny. Right. I'll yeah. be a tiny. Yeah. So you, you usually have like a 5% gross margin, 1% operating margin or something in a company like this. Uh, they're a distributor for um, pharmacy stuff if you go up. Yeah. I think they give the exact description of what they say. What do they describe themselves as? Provides healthcare, supply, supply chain, chain management, management, retail pharmacy, community, uh, oncology, oncology and specialty care. Okay. Yeah. 
um yeah i don't know what that means the other things that they're involved in and that, that would skew the margins if it if they really do that stuff um headquartered in irving texas not too far from where we're recording this no not too far uh i i don't know enough about these companies they're incredibly predictable uh if you don't see the part with the covid and all of that sort of thing obviously um sometimes they get sued that that happens sometimes so sometimes they have to pay out money and stuff uh, that it does occasionally occur for things but um otherwise they're very very stable in terms of what they do um even though the margins look low and everything, uh, when you adjust the variability for the the size of the what the mean is, the level of variability is so low that it's not actually jumping around all that much. The actual earnings compared to other companies. So even though they have, you know, uh, low single digit operating margins, their their business is not increasing and decreasing in terms of absolute profits more than a company with 20 percent margins often is so mm. it's fairly normal that way Retan- returns cash via buyback. stock yeah. and buyback and dividends as well and dividends too okay yeah um so what price do we have here we have whoops 21 dollars uh, per share 31 billion dollar market cap okay so what let's look at some uh, peaks in these things. So what was their peak? Um, well, we don't need to look at that. We have, uh, well, we haven't really seen growth in this business at all in the last five years or so. Really? We see some revenue growth showing up. Uh, right. Mm -hmm. But I'm not seeing that translating into growth in either gross profit or operating profit. Right. They're basically up and down. You know, they end up about where they started. Yeah, yeah. operating profit. Yeah. yeah. So you'd have to value it, I get, without knowing more about the company on a no growth basis. Um, and so just them buying back stock and paying dividends and then how cheap they are and all that. Uh, do we have... It's hard to tell without looking at the balance sheet and stuff because the EV to sales and, EV, and price to sales are obviously close, but that's just because sales is so big versus their price. So... Do they are they leveraged at all and stuff? Let's see. Um, total liabilities. No. They they have a pretty clean balance sheet. Um, I mean, total liabilities are only twenty billion more than their current assets. You know. Um, now you could say, I mean, they have some long term debt, but it's not really that big a deal. So if we look at the overview again, uh, we could just value it based on that. Let's see. Um, okay. So what do they say their market cap is? We'll just go with market cap instead of EV. 31 billion. It's, it's cheap compared to other stocks today. I mean, it's trading at only 10 times pre tax profits or something like that. And uh, companies today are generally trading at quite a bit more than that. It depends on what they do with the money. Obviously, they buy back stock and pay out on dividends. It works out well that way. Uh, free, we could look at free cash flow, but my guess is that if it barely grows at this point, you're not going to have dramatic free cash flow differences. Yeah. So it's actually going to do a very nice number. It's trading about 10 times free cash flow. Yeah. Looks pretty cheap. No growth. Cheap. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's on a relative cheap. basis. It's and somewhat absolutely, yeah. yeah. I mean, you're getting like a 10% free cash flow yield. Um, that's very cheap in today's world, yeah. But uh, and incredibly stable and presumably durable. I don't know enough about the industry, but I would assume so. Um, yeah, I think uh, it just looks like a value stock, basically. But the warning is, uh, you know, like I said, it might be no growth. Um, in the future and all that. So then of. I guess if you were to frame some research that you would be thinking through, would it be capital allocation then? What are they going to do with all this cash? The free cash flow that they generate every year? Yeah, I'd say so. Also, I, you might look to just see if you want to buy this company individually or also buy any other public trade company that does the same thing. Uh, there's only a handful of them, I believe. I mean, a large company like this, you could basically read the transcripts and I'm sure they'll have something on either buying back stock or, you know, their thoughts towards capital allocation, such a huge company. So a bunch of analysts probably follow the business. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. We could do one more. Hashtag Jeff. Should we type that in? That's the ETF name right there Uh (laughs) that we will, that will not start. uh, (laughs) 
You have to register that trademark. Yeah. Okay. SSNC Technologies Holdings. $18 billion market cap, $24.1 billion EV. Uh, SSNC Technology Holdings Inc. together with its subsidiaries provide software products and software enabled services to financial services and healthcare industries. The company owns and operates technology stack across securities accounting, front to back office operations, performance and risk analytics, regulatory reporting, and healthcare information processes. Uh, Ten-year CAGR of revenue thirty percent, going from two hundred seventy-one million in two thousand eleven to four point six billion in two thousand twenty. The return on invested capital chart there looks interesting. Uh, EV to sales five times. Ten-year median margins on EBIT twenty-two point four percent. EV to free cash flow twenty times. Uh, Gross margins of declined over the past uh 10 years nine ten years right now brain margin is slightly declined but it expanded in the middle there yeah uh-huh mm-hmm. uh it also allegedly has some leverage let's see what this means if we go up here yeah see it's there, but, somewhat but significant yeah like a third of the market cap in in net debt it's telling us i don't know if that's true yeah, it shows up. Yeah, that's all in long-term debt. That is an offset by cash, right? No. So it has some long-term debt that I don't know if that's stuff it acquired because you see it starts the period with none and then it gradually goes up that whole time. Um, Lots of goodwill. Yeah, so that would be the acquisition. So mm-hmm. it, is the goodwill bigger than the debt? Yeah, so basically they paid for yeah. it with debt. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we can tell that from here. Um, that basically they borrowed to buy stuff. So yeah, I don't Which understand. could explain that rapid revenue growth. Mm-hmm. growth and assets i don't understand what the business does unfortunately so i don't know how really how to comment on that um be hard you'd probably want to understand the position in the industry what they're doing mm-hmm. the competition these things are very competitive i feel like when you come across software companies like this yeah i mean look we i tweeted out yesterday something from one up on wall street okay and I actually was laughing because one time we were on a podcast and you were talking about how like buying a, a gravel pit, but like, that's just like, yes. that's something that you would do. If I think somebody asked if you were to invest in like a private business, what would it be? And yes, you've always said an arcade or a gravel pit, but yes. like, just like how not sexy that is. But Peter Lynch um, was actually talking about that exact concept, but it reminded me of when you said that and he was just talking about how owning a rock pit is safer than owning a jewelry business and just walk through the regional Mm -hmm. monopoly of it. Yeah. If you, uh, there's a company that still exists, that exists today called, uh, FRP holdings, I think. That's actually why I I found that because I was, I was doing research on the company. Did you see what their royalties were this last year? Yeah. I mean, mean, yeah. So it's, so they, uh, so their predecessor was uh, actually this family has two publicly traded companies, uh, FRP holdings and Patriot transportation, which are, um, basically the result of they owned something a long time ago um called florida rock and through a series of transactions they ended up with these companies where the rest of it was sold to um uh, a major aggregates company that's also publicly traded but you can see what the royalties are on what they own now they took a lot of those royalties and put it into like apartments so they own like apartment yeah. buildings and yeah, yeah they like those same sort of things about the what they think are like long-term assets, uh, you know, in terms of duration, they have predictable cash flow characteristics would benefit from inflation somewhat. So what's interesting about the, you know, FRP holdings is they break down um, the, uh, in their presentation, they did like a, it's a long presentation, right? I was it's just looking at it. Yeah. yeah. I literally, so it's so funny that we're talking about this because I was just looking at this company. Um, and then I found, good either. And then I found uh, that quote on okay. Wall, Wall Street. And then I thought we should do a podcast on valuing real estate, like companies that okay. have like apartment buildings and stuff like that. So that's in the queue, people. Stay okay. tuned. Stay tuned. So this, uh, yeah. So it, it's hard for me to um, recommend that presentation because it's very long and, and whatever and stuff. I, my guess is there's like an activist thing that kind of encouraged them to get their story out or whatever. I don't know if that's 100% true. But um, I don't think they decide on the investor day thing themselves. But the um, uh, royalties from their uh, from their quarries in, in Florida are interesting because they give a chart basically showing it from the time of the housing boom to now. And why it's a good business you know what i would say is that 
the huge decline in demand for the product did not result in much of a decline in pricing, you know, which is what we talked about with Lime and stuff. So a lot of times, I think people obsess too much in some industries about uh, demand and not enough about supply and and the competitive nature of that. And so they worry about like, you know, will there be more um, cars sold in 10 years or something instead of worrying about, well, will how many more will there be sold versus what the supply could be for it. So what's interesting is just that those companies make more money today than they did um, in 2005. But I think even where they had a big boom last year, they're probably below 80% of the actual volume that they were at. So you're not even, I don't know if you're three quarters or what, um, of your past peak. And you're basically having another boom. And so the next boom that you have is not even three or is maybe three quarters or something of what that old boom was, but you're making so much money from it. Whereas there's a lot of in more competitive industries, if you're, if you were below 75, 80% of your prior peak for 15 years, that'd be devastating to the industry. But if you have pricing power, then it's not. And so that's the kind of thing with rock pits is that they, they're not going to reduce their prices to buy a lot. Um, even when they have excess capacity Mm -hmm. and a lot of them, you can tell that because, you know, what they do an estimate of how much they're using of their reserves. And so you could see that right in the, uh, that at times they'll produce at levels that are incredibly short, uh, that are low versus their reserves. So they're producing at things that it would take them a hundred years to use up what they have and stuff. So yeah, I, I think it's a good business. Yeah. They kept the royalty parts on some of them. So it's pure royalties just for this company. So people know they don't actually even operate anything. Or whatever, um, but it's a it's a meaningful part of the business. I would value mm-hmm. it pretty high, although the I would say it does not add up to the majority of their value. Most of their value is in real estate holdings mm-hmm. and not the royalties. But the royalties are meaningful. Yeah, uh, the royalties maybe. Let's see, this is a five hundred million dollar valuation on it. Yeah, so over seventy percent probably of the value is in real estate, not what we're talking about. But you know the way that I would value it, the the um, aggregates business the royalties on that might be worth a third or a quarter or whatever of the overall valuation of the company so it's still a meaningful amount because you know it it doesn't really talk about that it own you know i mean the company does but if you just look this up on quick fs or something i don't think it would mention yeah, it doesn't break it down yeah it doesn't talk about what that is um uh, it's interesting just because the family's interesting stuff and even stuff that they've done with patriot um also has been kind of interesting capital allocation, the good capital allocation. And if you saw the long-term chart, you would like the long-term chart on this one because I think the chart goes back to the, um, it's been probably, the, it, it probably has a very long-term chart. Let's see what it can give you. But you wouldn't be, it would be tough to find this thing on a screen or whatever, but if you were looking at charts, you would find it mm-hmm. um, for things that have gone up a lot. Um <laughs> Internet so is your slow. issue the service here is very no slow? We're is not making we're not making a the... good pitch for OTC markets right now. Yeah, don't worry. I'm I'm going to there cut this go. out. I'm going to cut this All out. Right. I'm totally going to free out to cut this out. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we have this back to like 1992. So what was the stock at? In, uh, what was the three bucks? Three fifty. Okay. Yeah. And what's at now? Fifty four dollars. Mm-hmm. So you know that's not bad. You're getting in close to twenty times now. So you know eighteen times or whatever, which is pretty good. Mm. Uh, over that period of time i mean you can compare do compare to s&p 500 so people can see if you go on that compare level and and do that or yeah yeah, yeah. so you can see that even though the s&p 500 has gone up a lot there there's only a period of a few years in which you would have uh, underperformed what years were those in the early 2000 when, when does it go back to yeah 90 this is back to 92 so it's like 2000 right early 2000 so the s&p really point. only the s&p boom and bust yeah you know and the big stocks is the only time this stock would have had you behind mm-hmm. um so every other point since then you basically would have been doing about as well or better if you had put your money in this company instead of the s&p 500 and that's all i mean with the chart thing i'm not saying chart didn't try to figure out what the chart means and stuff i'm just saying you put money in this stock you put money in the s&p 500 um for most of the last 30 years or whatever, you'd be ahead in this stock. Mm-hmm. Then I'm interested in learning about that. Why is that? Yeah. You know, I think here it's capital allocation and also owning good assets in the first place. Well, that's a good representation of the capital allocation, right? If it's the same family that's been running it. Yeah. The other thing is that relative to the S&P 500, I think this stock is cheap. 
I don't want to say that I think the stock is cheap necessarily, but I think that the valuation placed on its assets versus the valuation on the S&P 500 is is cheap because the number I just gave you for like how I would value the the quarries um, is the the royalties on the quarries. Sorry, that you know um, is not. Uh, I'm using lower multiples than people probably would be for the S&P 500. I mean, those things probably have, I mean, some of them will be done and turned into housing developments or whatever at some point, but other ones won't be um, used up for 50 years, probably, depending on how quickly, you know, Florida develops and the prices will increase with inflation. You're getting protection against inflation, um, which you're not getting to the same extent with the S&P 500. Uh, so, I mean, which would I rather own at the multiples that I was saying, I would, I'd much rather own their royalties on those pieces of property than I would rather own the S and P 500. Yeah. Got it. Cool. Well, we're going to do a future podcast on real estate and stuff like that. We have, I don't think we've ever done one. People ask about real estate all the time. A lot of value investors are always, I'm not someone that knows much about real estate that way. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can value, I mean, to to some extent, apartment buildings aren't all that different. I think to, to quarries and things like that. I mean, I would much rather own a quarry than an apartment building because the problem is that I think people exaggerate. I mean, what can you really charge much for rents and stuff? If 30, 40 years into life of that thing, we were just talking about that here. You know, I live in apartments that were a very um, most desirable location and stuff when they were built 20 years ago. No. Now they're not. They became less desirable after they built something new five years ago. And then yeah. they built something new like right in the last the year or so yeah. further out that's reduced the desirability of, you know, everything else that way or mm. has made more competition for it. So I think they have a long life. I don't think they have as long a life as a quarry. As a quarry. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Have you but, looked at US Lime at all recently? Yeah. That's done pretty well. It has. A, anything related to cement and lime and all of that has yeah, done well. Yeah, Monarch's done well. Yeah. Those things have all done well. Um, <laughs> Another long chart, a long term chart company. Yeah. Um, and maybe the fact that it's mixed together in FRP holdings, uh, apartments, and because, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, I don't want to. <sighs> I don't want to sound too optimistic about a, a FRP holdings because I, I don't think it's really all that cheap. I don't want to exaggerate how cheap I think it is. But if you broke out the pieces and compared each of what they own, like what valuation people put on apartments that are similar to it otherwise, and among publicly traded companies, and the same thing for um, aggregates, mm-hmm. they put very high valuations on each of those pieces at large public companies. Now, I think they're excessive. I think there's too much. Uh, the multiples are too high on those things right now. You know, I would never buy apartment buildings at the prices they're putting on for companies that own portfolios of apartment buildings. I think that's crazy. And I think they're trading at premiums to like what the actual, those assets would trade hands in out in the real world, like you know, for control of them. So I'd be cautious. But definitely there, someone will do a write-up on Value Investors Club or something at some point that will break out like here versus each of their peers and will show that they're very cheap. I was going to say, have they have activists come knocking basically saying they should spin off the real estate portion and then turn it into a REIT or something I mean, I think lines? if they were completely... I, I do think that if they were broken up, um, they would trade at a higher price. Uh-huh. Like if it was broken up, for instance, if that was... Uh, if the... Um, if the aggregate stuff was just structured as a trust that paid everything out and, um, and you know, and you were talking about with the apartments with it, it was just a read or something. Um, I do think there'd be a higher valuation on it. I don't think in the long run that like the actual value would be higher because they're not able to take money from something and put it into other things through the exchanges that they do and stuff like that. So basically when they sell some property or whatever, then they then roll it over into other property. Um, and that you end up, I don't think that the long-term value would be higher, but I do think that day one, if you broke it up, people would value it higher. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think if you did like a road show and split up the company and stuff that the today, as of today, it would be valued higher, but I don't know how much of that is the environment today that has such high valuations on things like apartments and, uh, and things like, you know, aggregates and stuff. I think those are valued very highly in the market right now. Um, uh, you know, as compared to like the long term history of those assets, they're valued differently. I mean, they weren't valued as high in 2010. People didn't like the aggregate companies as much. You could see that we just did US 
line, but it could be, I mean, even in micro caps and things, all of that stuff has gone up a lot. And so you could imagine that there would be a lot of excitement about an aggregates company, especially one that's all Florida. Um, and that's purely royalties is all that they do. There's no complexity to it at all. The same thing with the owning apartments. Yeah. And where some of the apartments are and everything. Yeah. They own other stuff too. We didn't mention, you know, but those are the big kind of portions in terms of what I think people would put the highest multiples on. Mm -hmm. Got it. Cool. Well, I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with the both of us. If you are watching on YouTube right now, uh, you want to get access to this website, uh, go to quickfs.net. And when you do sign up, tell them that you came from Focused Compounding. Uh, make sure you hit that subscribe button wherever you are watching or listening uh, to us. That helps spread the word. Thank you so much, everybody, for the support. Um, I'm going to use this thread in the future uh to work our way through all of the stocks i think we have like over yeah we got 55 replies so that means there's way more than 55 stocks on there somebody actually said this is uh the best screener i've seen today i think that's kind of funny uh probably true so uh be sure to follow me on twitter at focused compound thank you so much everyone for the support and we will see you in the next podcast <laughs> <laughs>